Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I am Mary Eisen sitting in for Jonathan Hessen. We intended this conversation to be a post-election discussion, and it will indeed have this function, but it turned out that this will also have a pre-election dimension, as the two leading candidates will face each other in a runoff on the 28th of this month. Therefore, all lessons learned from President Erdogan's performance, his failure to clear the 50% bar, but may yet emerge victorious, must be seen as interim. Final judgment on Turkey's domestic and foreign courses for the next term will have to wait for another chat, probably next month. Joining us from Istanbul, Turkey, are Mr. Yusuf Erim, TRT World Editor-at-Large, and also Thanks joining us, me. thank you. Also joining us from Ankara, Turkey, are Mr. Omer Ozkizilijik, foreign policy and security analyst. Thanks for having me. And with us, as always, is our own Amir Oren. Amir, let's start on this journey: elections, pre-elections, again elections. But we want to talk about what we can expect. So let's start out with what is happening now in Turkey. What would she, we? What should we expect? Well, you know, Mary, in the age of uh, saturation media, uh, we uh, seem to uh, grow to know uh, long-serving leaders, uh, especially uh, the uh, few democratically elected leaders, not uh, the dictators like Bashar Assad or Vladimir Putin. And there are so uh, few of them. Um, Angela Merkel was one. Uh, Netanyahu lost, but then came back. And... Uh, Erdogan, uh, we almost lost. Um, if uh, we read uh, some of the analysis uh, before um, the uh, uh, the election uh, on Sunday, um, we believe that um, uh, his time may be up. But lo and behold, um, if uh, it was not for a half a percentage point, uh, he would have won uh, in the first round. His party won the uh, elections to parliament, which is also an important factor. And um, there are several questions which um, our Turkish friends uh, would be in a better position uh, to dissect, uh, whether the coalition behind the challenger uh, can uh, stay together for um, another uh, 10 days or so, and um, uh, whether whatever happens uh, either domestically or in the foreign policy and national security arena in the, in the time between today, tonight, and the 28th, whether this will play into Erdogan's hands. So here we are at this stage where Erdogan almost made it, but didn't make it. And when we looked at the political map of who voted where, I find it fascinating to be talking to somebody sitting in Ankara, somebody sitting in Istanbul, and to think in that sense of what the map of the elections that took place and before the second round for the elections for president actually mean. Um, Yusuf, I'm going to start with you first as you're sitting right now in Istanbul. And I found the map itself fascinating. What it showed me in the elections of who voted for Erdogan and who voted for the opponent was an interesting map of Turkey. It looked very similar in its own way to something that I see in the United States, West Coast, East Coast. But in this case, it was the West, the facing Europe, the facing the Mediterranean, seemed to be voting for Erdogan's opponent. And the whole center of the country was voting for Erdogan. And then on the East, in the Kurdish areas, I could see voting for the opponent. Can you take us a bit through what this means in, for example, the next elections? How will that look in the next time? Well, uh, as you stated, like in the United States, where you have uh, red states and your blue states uh, signifying the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, in Turkey, you have your red states signifying the CHP or red provinces, let's say, and you have your orange provinces representing the uh, AKP. And uh, again, you have your uh, Kurdish vote also, which is usually represented in purple, and uh, the heartland of Turkey, Anatolia, uh, generally, and has always been an AKP stronghold. Uh, while the Aegean coast, Mediterranean coast, and uh, certain areas of uh, Thracian uh, Turkey have uh, always been 
uh, supporters of the CHP. And uh, from region to region, yes, it uh, definitely does have a uh, very an identifiable uh, vote in areas. And I, I would, I guess I would say coastal areas generally, uh, generally have socially been always closer to the CHP uh, since the Ak Party era. Before the Ak Party era, they haven't always been CHP. They have identified at times with other parties. But when we go into the heartland of Turkey, uh, you have a very conservative vote. You have uh, very conservative people uh, living, growing up there. Uh, when you look at the jobs, generally the jobs are blue-collar blue jobs from uh, the Anatolian region. So uh, these people tend to matriculate to ideologies that are uh, that favor them voting for the AKP. So this has never been strange. Uh, I think many countries have this type of uh, signifying and identifying map that represents the characteristics and ideologies of residents from certain regions. And uh, Turkey is no different. I find that fascinating. And as I look at Turkey and as I think, Omer, you're sitting in Ankara, and I wonder to myself, so these differences, and let's start domestically, the differences between these different voter blocks in that sense, do they also represent things domestically beyond what I heard also Yusuf say before, a more conservative vote? What would be these differing agendas in their voting for these two vastly different candidates? Are they looking for a different domestic agenda later on? We'll also talk about the foreign policy agenda. So first of all, we have to uh, clearly assess that uh, in Turkey, there are some voting, two main voting blocks, and they don't change their votes. So uh, aspects like economy or political promise of the opposition parties or the Turkish voting party doesn't matter to these people. They vote for their party. They have identified themselves with the CHP or with the AKP uh, or with the uh, Green Left Party in the southeast of Turkey. But then there are the people who are in between, who aren't sure who, for whom they would vote. And for those people, uh, political aspects matter. And uh, the map you are referring to isn't uh, no surprise to anyone in Turkey, everyone expecting a map like this, uh, as the previous maps and elections were similar. But the question is always, what is the margin of victory for uh, CHP in uh, the West? What's the margin of Erdogan of victory in the central of Turkey? That's the main issue and that's the main discussion. So the people who are in between, who do not identify themselves uh, uh, with any party, they are the ones who make the decisions in Turkey. And these people uh, make the decisions in Turkey. So what we have seen so far is that Erdogan had, was not able to win in the first round, not because of uh, he lost votes but, uh, to his opponent, Kalic Taolo, but because of uh, the third uh, candidate, Sinan Oran, who managed to get votes from Erdogan's strongholds. So for instance, a province which had a record high turnout for Erdogan in the past, Konya has given uh, seven percent points to Sinan Oran, which was quite shocking, and uh, Erdogan's uh, voting count in this province decreased. So th he, Sinan Oran, namely, was the reason why uh, this did not end in the first round. And this social dynamic in Turkey is going to persist. We have an approximately 60 to 65 percent of uh, conservative nationalist bloc, and then a uh, 35 to 40 percent uh, bloc of uh, leftist uh, Kurds and secular Turks and uh, other leftist orientations in Turkey. So that gives us a little bit more about the voters and what could possibly be expecting. And I'm sitting here both from the view from Israel with our two guests who are sitting in Turkey as we speak right now. And immediately I'm thinking of the other aspects. One aspect would be the Syrian refugees. How does that impact? And I first again want to go around that aspect of both the economy, the Syrian refugees, how that could impact. And then afterwards, what we could expect in a sense of very vastly different foreign policies between these two different candidates? So we have to see uh, what happens uh, after the uh, candidates uh, who lost, after they give their endorsements uh, to the remaining uh, two, whether their followers will follow, uh, whether they will uh, obey uh, uh, the uh, leader, or whether they will be um, independently thinking and choose uh, whoever is uh, more to their liking. Now, um, one interesting uh, aspect here uh, regarding the Kurdish vote 
is that this is both a domestic and a foreign policy issue because of Syria, because of PKK. And um, one wonders whether the Kurdish support for Erdogan's opponent is a blessing or a curse for him, because uh, this could um, help Erdogan in the second round call on uh, his followers or on the more indifferent ones. Perhaps this will help the turnout to uh, come and vote for him, because otherwise the Kurds uh, will uh, have a bigger say in the government. And another point is that uh, Erdogan's opponent is Alevi, or Alawite, as the Syrians uh, call it, as is Bashar Assad. Whether this will have an impact, our guests would know. So I'm going to take that in that sense from two different things that Amir was talking about. Yusuf, I'm coming back again to you, and I'm wondering about the combination of the economy, of the horrific earthquake that happened in Turkey just a few months ago, and the impact that that's going to have. Is that what brought Erdogan down? Is it because of his foreign policy in that sense? I'll, I'll put it on the opposite side. What we're all saying, Erdogan was so strong, and he didn't manage to get through in that first round. So these different aspects that um, Amir brought up may help him or not in the second round, but could you help us understand a bit better what are those main focal points for for the people inside Turkey right now? Okay, well, the, I mean, the main focal, focal points heading into this election were obviously number one, the economy and inflation. This was uh, by and far the main issue, uh, very quickly followed by earthquake recovery. I think the earthquake recovery, especially for uh, the 11 provinces that were devastated uh, by the disaster, where it was obviously number one. and. Uh, Again, uh, migration, I think migration was very, very important. And when we look at the results of May 14th and we see a nationalist vote that has reached 25 percent, when I mean 25 percent, looking at the vote of the MHP uh, combined with uh, the opposition E party, who is also a nationalist party, combined with the vote of Atta Alliance, which is also a nationalist group, and with also BBP, you get a 25% nationalist voting bloc. Uh, this is a record level nationalist vote for Turkish history. Tur the nationalist vote has never reached 25%. So the question is why? I think the migration issue, uh, coupled with national security concerns, coupled, coupled with uh, rhetoric from the opposition bloc regarding the possibility of autonomy uh, in certain regions in southeastern uh, Turkey led many voters to matriculate to these na nationalist parties that they felt could protect their national security concerns in Ankara politically at parliament. So that was a big voter reaction that we saw regarding that issue. When we go back to the earthquake uh, recovery issue, we saw that Erdogan has received a tremendous amount of votes and his alliance has also received a tremendous amount of votes from the earthquake zone. So uh, the narrative in the earthquake zone that uh, the government's response was very slow, that uh, the, the people in the earthquake zone have been unhappy with the recovery efforts. Uh, we can see on election day that many of those narratives have come out false because the reality is voters in the earthquake zone are voting for Erdogan. He has protected his vote in almost all of the 11 provinces, uh, except for one or two, uh, where he's still very close to his original vote from 2018. Uh, besides that, he's done very well in the earthquake zone. And going back to the economy, uh, economy is something that he has been punished for a little by the voters. But the other side, the opposition alliance and Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, Tarolo, uh, seem not to have convinced voters enough to punish Erdogan where it would matter and the opposition would be able uh, to emerge with the victory. Because when you look at the opposition vote, I think it's very important. The opposition vote, uh, May 14th versus the opposition vote from 2018, you see that the opposition really hasn't increased its vote. It's only consolidated its opposition vote under one candidate. That makes it fascinating in its own way for us as we're sitting here and discussing the subject. Omar, I want to take this a step further and focus in more first domestically in Turkey 
on the, and it's a question of how you call it in Turkey, the Syrian presence, the Syrian refugee presence. What Amir also mentioned before, the candidate being from an Alavi, Alawite background, and that connection that everybody connects outside of Turkey, at least, to Bashar Assad, who's also Alawite. How much does this play inside these elections and re-elections? How much do you think that this portion of it will have an impact? So first of all, let me start with the uh, Alawite and Alawite uh, issue. First of all, the Alawites in Syria have historically, demographically, socially, religiously, ideologically, nothing to do with the Alawites in Turkey. So they accept that the learn. names sound quite f familiar with each other. So uh, the uh, tradition from the, uh, of the Turkish Alawites with the Arab Alawites in Syria are much different historically. Their religious leaders, etc., are all different persons. So, uh, and the identity of Khalid Shol as an Alawite has not played a, an important role. It played a very minor role. Erdogan has not used this against him in any way in his rhetoric, etc. And we have seen that, as you pointed out, that the opposition was uh, has consolidated itself and has not lost votes. But the uh, issue is that the opposition was unable to get votes from Erdogan uh, to its uh, camp. And this is the main issue why uh, Erdogan will most likely win in the second round with an easy victory against Kamakovic Tarolo. And here, uh, about the issue of the Syrian refugees, we have to clearly assess that the Syrian refugee issue was uh, the very first top agenda a year ago, but uh, it decreased in importance. And the reason for that uh, are two main issues. The first is the uh, focus of the election change. Erdogan managed to change the focus of the elections from economy and from the Syrian refugees to security and uh, to uh, the issue that uh, nationalist values that the opposition was going to work with uh, terrorist entities. And here, I think uh, statements from senior PKK leaders in the media uh, that they support Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu played massively against them. And secondly, the fact that one of the four candidates had to withdraw from election due to fake uh, documents and fake video material published by exiled Gülen sect members uh, has also played against Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu and consolidated Erdogan's base at, uh, for Erdogan, except for the ones who went to Sinan Oran. So the Syrian refugee issue isn't that high anymore. The second issue for uh, the second reason for the Syrian refugees decrease in importance was Erdogan's policy to speak with Bashar al-Assad. Even though for Turkey's Syrian approach and Syrian policy, speaking with Bashar al-Assad from my perspective is a mistake, I have also clearly to assess and admit that from a domestic point of view, Erdogan managed to get this refugee card out of the hand of the opposition. And the opposition have seen that their main argument in this regard, which is speaking with Assad, uh, has been done and they did not uh, emphasize the Syrian refugee issue as much as they have been doing a, a year ago. So as we listen to what Omer is saying, and here, Amir, it's you and me in the studio, and I'm going, wow, Erdogan and Bashar Assad, I, I want to use the word zigzag. I want to use the word of really 11, 12 years. I'm against Bashar. I'm for Bashar. I'm against Bashar. I'm with the Islamists. I'm against. And here I am. And within these upcoming re-elections, when we look at that foreign policy, when we look at the differences between these two different candidates, we're going to have this run up at the end of the month. What does it mean when it comes to Turkey, Syria to Turkey, and that whole detente scene that we're seeing within the greater Middle East? So in the Middle East, uh, consistency doesn't uh, get you very far. Um, <laughs> if you uh, stick to your campaign pledges and then to the very first uh, policy announcement, uh, usually you end up uh, losing your uh, re-election uh, bid. So um, rather than, than predict um, what will happen um, in Erdogan's next term, um, we should uh, take a moment to note that uh, contrary to expectations, this election was relatively free. Uh, we all have this image of an authoritarian Erdogan, uh, and uh, obviously he is not a British uh, prime minister or a German chancellor. 
But uh, having said that, and uh, of course, mindful that Donald Trump uh, is saying that elections in the United States are rigged, all in all, um, he could have used his um, uh, levers on power um, in a more authoritarian way in order to secure a first round victory and did not. So perhaps he is mellowing and uh, we will see a, a softer Erdogan in the next term. Um, do either of you, and I'm going to start on that side and start with Omer this time and then after Yosef, do either of you think that Erdogan will lose in the next round? Omer, what do you think no, is going I to happen? Not, I do not think that Erdogan will lose. It's very probably and very likely that Erdogan will win by a big margin and will break his own personal record in the elections. And this is mainly to uh, some many reasons. The most important are the voters from Sinanoan are actual uh, Erdogan voters. So they will go to Erdogan uh, voting again for their uh, first uh, former choice. And the second issue is that the opposition is now in a situation of trauma and they are really, uh, they lost their motivation. Uh, and we can see this from all across the Turkish opposition media, the Turkish opposition social media, and also Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu show himself, he, must, he was almost gone for 20 hours, and then he came back with a video which uh, in which he tried to galvanize the people again. But I think even the um, election participation of the Turkish opposition supporters will also decrease in the elections, and uh, Erdogan's victory will most likely be by a landslide. That being said, uh, this is Turkey. Everything can happen in 24 hours. But if nothing uh, game-changing happens, Erdogan will win an easy victory in two weeks. Then I'm going to take what you just said, Omar, and I'm going to go to you, Yusuf. You brought up two very drastically different issues, domestic economy and then the security national issues. And I find it fascinating in its own way in the equivalent sitting here in Jerusalem, where we always say that we go to elections because of the economy, but you win the elections through the security. How much in that sense on that domestic regional aspect, domestically also inside Turkey, is Erdogan on the economic platform? Is Erdogan on the security platform? What matters more? Well, I think it's both. Uh, when we look at the economy since Erdogan came to power back in uh, 2001, uh, he's enjoyed re-election on top of re-election because of his economic performance. Uh, and the current state of economy, the general consensus or view uh, amongst voters regarding Erdogan is that, yes, the economic situation right now is because of him, but at the same time, he's the person that can best fix the economic situation as well. So it's a it's a very interesting love-hate relationship uh, with Erdogan amongst the voter when it comes to the economy. They blame him for it, but they also only believe that he's the only one that can fix it as well. And I think that's a very interesting voter behavior, voter psychology when it comes to the economy. And uh, I think it's the same thing with national security as well. They believe that Erdogan is the best suited leader to protect the country's national security, whether it be uh, versus terror groups, whether it be uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, whether it be uh, against uh, uh, Iran, or whether it be in the Caucasus protecting Azerbaijan's nat national security. These are all issues that uh, the Turkish voter believes Erdogan could uh, best uh, pursue and best uh, advance on behalf of the Republic of Turkey. And uh, when it comes to a prediction, I the, I reflect on much of Ömer's views. I do believe that Erdogan will uh, very handily win uh, on May 28th. I think that he only needs uh, a very small increment uh, of uh, Sinan Erdogan's votes. He'll be able to protect his uh, May 14th uh, totals. But I think that the opposition voters are demoralized. I think uh, the uh, People's Alliance's victory uh, over parliament is also a very huge boost. I don't think uh, many voters are warm on seeing uh, one alliance take uh, parliament and the other alliance take the presidency. I think they understand that uh, that'll cause bureaucratic uh, slowdowns and that uh, it'll create a very ineffective uh, governance. So they will reward Erdogan also for the parliamentary victory. So a demoralized opposi opposition coupled with uh, Erdogan being able to mobilize his voters, I think that uh, he will break his personal record, which is uh, a little over 52.5%. And I think that he will probably 
uh, go home uh, on the May, uh, on the night of May 28th with a, a new five-year mandate and a personal record uh, high vote. I find it fascinating, Amir. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking of my domestic front. Here we are talking about Turkey and everything that both Yusuf and Omar just said. I just it, To me, it was like, hmm, interesting to hear it about a different country. So here we are rounding up towards the end of our program. When we look forward after these elections that took place, the next elections that are going to take place, what does this mean in general? Let's bring it to a close. Um, allow me to deflect your question and uh, reframe one of mine to our two Turkish guests. Obviously, one does not stay in power for more than 20 years by being complacent, even though the prediction that uh, you pronounced uh, is uh, also Erdogan's. Does he have the uh, ability to do something um, an international incident vis-a-vis -vis Greece or in Syria in order to change it. And I know that you only have some 10 or 15 seconds each for a yes or no answer. Yes, I personally think that, uh, first of all, foreign policy issues don't play any significant role in domestic Turkish politics and electoral behavior. But I think that Erdogan has proven to be the king of pragmatism. And when it suits him, he can change his position uh, according to the interests of himself and the interests of Turkey. Very clear. Yusuf? Well, Erdogan's a very unique leader because uh, he's been in power over 21 years, and uh, generally there's voter fatigue when you have a leader in power so long. But he's been able to reinvent himself. Uh, he's been able to uh, push the story, the story that's important for voters. He's been able to set it. He's always been able to set it. Uh, again, foreign policy is not a game changer in elections unless it was a major national security issue, but uh, he doesn't need anything like that. I think that he's uh, being able to set the agenda in voters' minds, and that's uh, the most important thing when it comes to elections. Absolutely. Amir, a fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank our viewers. I'd like to thank our two distinguished guests joining us in from Turkey, and I hope to see you again here in Jerusalem studio.